Uh, welcome back to our uh, to our study. Uh, this is the second hour of our first day on our creation special, and it is what is it? August, September, September eighth, seventh, September seventh. But it's the eighth. Yeah. Okay. The notes will say the seventh because that's when they were written, and they always automatically put the date in, and I didn't change it to fit for today. So it is uh, September eighth. And we're picking up with slide, no, page, page number, page 10 of the notes. And um, I didn't number the slides. Uh, that takes too long. Uh, so page 10. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, the opportunity to utilize 1 John 1, 9 if necessary. Uh, if you have said bad things about the pastor during the break and you want to confess them, you may do that now. Or if you've done anything else sinful, <laughs> you may do that now. First uh, John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please uh, do that if you need to, and then we'll get started. Father, as we look at this next hour, we ask for your insight into the questions and the answers that we have and the, uh, and the data that we look at uh, as we study. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're back to the History of the Gap Theory article. Uh, and he, uh, he was referencing something that he was talking about with Larkin that I went ahead and did Larkin. Okay, so when you understand this truth, it cuts a clear path through the confusion of conflicting theories and interpretations that have occupied the ongoing creation versus science debate. The essence of that debate will be discussed in a following chapter that we won't get to till next week. For now, it is very important that we show you the biblical clues that tell us why 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7 is not a reference to Noah's flood. Clue number one, compare the phrase, the heavens and earth which are now, to the phrase, the heavens were of old. What does this mean? Ask yourself this question. When Noah's flood happened, did it change anything in the upper heavens? Would a flood on the earth's surface have any effect on the sun or the moon or the stars high above? Good, uh, good point, huh? The obvious answer is no. The heavens of Noah's days were the same heavens as in Adam's day. The same sun, same moon, same stars, same planet Mars. Fact, Noah's flood had no effect on the upper heavens. All of Noah's flood's effects were confined to the earth's surface and its atmosphere. And although the Bible speaks about the windows of heaven being opened and water coming down, the context of that reference is the first heaven, which is the earth's atmosphere. Okay? But 2 Peter uh, says, the heavens and the earth which are now, to the phrase, the heavens which were of old. So he's talking about multiple heavens, not just a heaven. The worst atmosphere, or first heaven, is where the rain comes from. Keep in mind that the Bible says there are three heavens. This will be explained in great uh, detail, not shortly, but later. Again, note the contrasting comparison between the phrases, the heavens were of old, before the waters of 2 Peter 3, 5, and 7, and the heavens and the earth which are now, after the waters of 2 Peter 3, 5 through 7. So definite, definite heavens, not heaven, not atmosphere. First heaven, second heaven, or third heaven, but, all, but more than one heaven. So obviously the atmosphere and outer space had to be involved because we know, of course, nothing affects God's heaven, all three heavens. So. If the effects of Noah's flood were confined to the earth's surface and the atmosphere, then Noah's flood did not affect or alter anything in the upper heavens. So logic demands that this verse must be speaking about an event other than Noah's flood. Good logic, right? And Genesis 1-2 is our only other biblical candidate. And will always be, because what did, what did God tell Noah after the flood? The rainbow prof, uh, promise? Never destroy the earth again with water. Okay. which you could take, okay, you destroyed it with the flood, that's once, never again. 
But if you realize, oh, he's, flo- he's, he's destroyed it twice with water, then it makes more sense to say, I'll never do it again with water. Now, if you do something once, you know, well, what's, what's the, what are the chances you're going to do it again? But if you've done something twice, yeah, good, good, likely you'll do it again. So that's why the promise was necessary that, uh, that he wouldn't do it again. Huh? Clue number two. Number two. Notice also in the passage that the earth is said to be standing out of the water and in the water. In our English language, these descriptive terms suggest that these particular waters were not confined to the surface of the planet. They overflowed the entire planetary system. This is a different theory than most gappers believe. Okay? This is different than Larkin. This guy is saying that this was our whole solar system, not just the planet Earth itself. So let's see if he has any good uh, argument for that. The Bible says that part of the planet was standing out from these waters. That is to say, the sphere of the planet was partially overflowed and the location of the bulk of the waters was external to the earth itself. Well, that sounds a little, that doesn't quite convince me of anything. The Bible says the planet was in the water. Aha! of this particular flood. Think of a round fishing floater bobbing in a lake, right? like a, a bobber uh, in the water. It's in the water, okay? And part of it is out of the water, okay? So if you take a round fishing bobber and you say that the lake is our solar system and you drop that in the water, then the planet is in that water of the, that's engulfing the entire solar system and but is standing out of the water, out of that water. Okay, that's what he's saying. In other words, part of the earth is protruding from the waters and not simply just covered by waters on the surface. <coughs> okay. How else would you explain, to take his side here for a moment and try to, uh, try to make his point, since obviously some of you aren't buying it. All right, so. Okay, are we supposed to be agreeing with him? <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask that question. Well, and are, is he taking the Greek and the Hebrew words correctly? Like is, when, so when he's saying in the water, like is that really what the Greek and the Hebrew says it that way? Uh, essentially, yes. Essentially, yes. Okay. All right. So uh, here's uh, here's the earth. Okay. And it's covered, covered with water, right? Whole earth is covered with water. Is the earth in the water? How could the earth be in the water? You see his point? Okay. The earth is in the water and out of the water. So that means there has to be water all around here. The planet. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, but we have no, no inkling that there was any part of the earth that wasn't in the water. That wasn't covered by water. I mean, that would say that... that the water covered this much of the earth but didn't cover that part of the earth. But it says it was total. So it couldn't be this. It couldn't be that some of the earth was not covered by water. Some of the earth out of the water, some of the earth in the water. The Meaning land. Part of the earth was in the water and part of it wasn't. 
Well, but that would have to be a bobber that was covered with water. Okay, the bobber, you know, his, he didn't, he didn't cover it completely. Yeah. So the whole earth was still covered with water, but... Was in the water. That's why he's saying that it was a solar system-wide water. Okay. So, okay. So I, I want you to get his point before we decide if we agree with it or not. Because what good does it do? If I say, we're, we don't believe this, and you're not going to pay any attention to the rest of it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so let's see what he has to say. Literal English wording of this passage does not describe a flood event confined to the Earth's surface. This passage describes a deluge that raged across the solar system and beyond. Our solar system and outer space are the second heaven of the Bible's three, uh, Bible three heavens. Try to draw this mental picture. Think of a dark and ruined solar system with water strewn throughout like one big messy galactic spill. That is what Genesis 1-2 is speaking about. And imagine the planet Earth drifting awash in this roaring and rolling formless mess. Where would such waters have come from? Well, it's an established scientific observation that aging stars create and give off lots of water. Certainly there must have been lots and lots of stars in the heavens that were of old, and if something had caused the entire cosmos to have, to have gone dark and the stars died, then there would be excessive water everywhere throughout space. Well, what have they, uh, what have they just recently discovered on Mars? Evidence that there was water covering the planet Mars. Right? Ooh. 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 So... Maybe he's got something here. It's worth listening to. So you have to remember, when you're talking about the gap theory, it's all theory. Okay? I'm only going to tell you what the truth is okay, about the theories. But I'm not going to tell, I can't tell you that it's true because we don't have a God said... If that was indeed the case, then all those extinguished stars would need to be reignited to be seen in our present heavens. Although many gap theory advocates, Larkin, that we read last hour, believe that the sun, moon, and stars were not affected and were only being obscured by deep cloud cover until the fourth of the seven days, that interpretation does not hold up under closer scrutiny of the scriptures. Why it does not will become clear as we examine the Genesis narrative by precept upon precept and line upon line. Let's review. And the earth was without form and void. Tohu va bohu. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. At Genesis 1-2, the heaven and the earth are in darkness, and great waters are upon the deep. So what is the deep? Well, he says, if we interpret the deep to include everything in the physical universe, as opposed to God's heavenly realm far above, then the situation becomes clear. Before any reconstruction of the heavens and the earth could begin, God had to do something with all that water scattered across space. That's why the Bible says that God divided the waters. It was the first order of business after the Lord God turned on the work lights. Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. How could there be light if there were no stars? How could there be light until what day? The fourth day when he created or made visible? Well, actually, it's, did it say he created the sun and the moon and the stars? Or did he say, let them be seen? Hmm, we'll have to get to that, won't we? All right. And this verse does not say that this division was between the waters on the earth's surface and the clouds up in the sky, or describe the construction of some imagined water canopy, which is the primary gap theory, as there was a water canopy of ice above the earth that was the later water source for Noah's flood after uh, it was thawed and then became atmospheric moisture, you know, like we have now, clouds. Uh, that is not what the Bible is saying, he says. And God made the firmament, and God divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. 
The Bible is saying that God established a three heaven structure between the earth and the heavenly abode of the Ancient of Days. Three heavens, atmosphere, universe, and God's abode. The firmament is the abode of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the galaxies. In other words, it is speaking of the entire physical universe. And the Bible says that God placed waters above that firmament. In doing so, he placed a sea between the footstool of his heavenly throne and the less than pure physical universe down below. So now we've expanded this realm of Satan and the fallen angels from just being the earth to being the whole universe, physical universe. <coughs> that kind of makes sense. You know, I mean, a third of the angels, millions and millions of angels, be awfully crowded on the earth if that's where they were. But put them throughout the physical universe, there's plenty of room for them, right? Okay? In other words, he's speaking of the entire physical universe, and the Bible says that God placed waters above that firmament. In so doing, he placed a sea between the footstool of his heavenly throne and the less than pure physical universe down below. In other words, he separated all of creation from his heaven. Prayerfully consider the schematic diagram below because this is what the division was all about. There, you don't have this one because uh, I didn't want to print out uh, in black ink and, and take all my ink out of my printer. But uh, so here's the waters on the earth's surface. Here's the first heaven, the earth's atmosphere in the first heaven. Okay. Then there's the second heaven, the vacuum of outer space. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from above. Waters above the firmament, okay, which create a barrier between the created universe and God's heaven. Okay. So all of the universe frozen. Okay. Was it all entirely water, frozen water? Or was there just enough of the frozen to inactivate the fallen angels? I don't know, but it's, it kind of makes some sense. Kind of makes some sense. We might have to look up firmament and, and delve into firmament a little more to, uh, to find out. All right. Also make note that in Genesis 1.8, the Lord God says nothing about this being good. Although God says it was good concerning days 1, Three, four, five, and six. He does not say that about the work of the second day. Ever wondered about that? Hmm. The answer is very simple. Although this division was not good, it was necessary to protect the creation from the flaming glory of God's holiness. Nothing impure can stand in his presence, and even the presence of a regenerated heavens and earth was not completely pure before God. See Job 25.5. Back to Job again. Okay. So, he doesn't say it's good. There's got to be a reason. So we'll have to delve into that probably more. There is a whole sermon that could be preached about the significance of this division, but I digress. These things will be discussed in detail later in this study. So, we'll get a better argument later. So for now, what is it? It's another aspect of, a th of the theory, the gap theory, okay, that we'll need to try to iron out at the, in the end. Okay. All right, so the next we would go into the history of the gap theory interpretation, uh, and, uh, but if we do that, we're never going to have time for questions. So we're going to save that for next week, but we are going to go to the Isaiah 43, 7, and the creation verbs, probably the next to the last page of your notes, near the end of the slides. Page 20, and which corner? Bottom right. Okay, so there should be like three slides, this one and then the two on the back of the page to complete it. All right, here's Isaiah 43, 7. Uh, Everyone that is called by my name... Uh, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Okay. So, 
what has come from this way of expressing things in the English, from the English Bibles, King James Bible predominantly, is uh, where you uh, repeat for effect or repeat for emphasis. So if I say this, everyone is called by my name for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. We'd say, oh, that's really, he's, God is making sure you get it that he is the one that is the creator, right? If you leave out my, my uh, brackets there and just read it that way, modern politicians will, you know, when they're speaking, They'll repeat themselves in a different way for emphasis to make you really think that they're, they're really saying something. Okay. Well, that came because of English translations rather than understanding what the Hebrew actually said because each of these words is different. The first word for created is bara, and the second word for formed is yatser, and the third word is asa. So there are three different words to say something, and he's not just repeating himself, he's breaking it down for us. And so here we need to know what he's breaking down, what he is saying. Bara means to form something out of nothing. Okay. Well, that's the soul, man's soul. Okay. Yatser means to sculpt something, to, to take it and put it together, you know, and mold it, sculpt it into a shape. Well, we know that he did that from what? Adam means red, the red clay that he used to form the body. Well, the red clay that he used to form the body was the molecules that were found in the earth. Guess what? Everything that makes you up is a molecule found in the dirt. Okay? Nothing that came out of nothing for your body. Your body came out of dirt. For dirt you are and to dirt you shall return, right? That's how we do funerals. Okay? And so that's the sculpting. He took all of the molecules and put them together. You're what, 78% water? Uh, mostly calcium left over after that, and then uh, some other elements, and you're worth about, well, it used to be worth $3.17, but with inflation now you're worth uh, probably a couple of hundred bucks of the elements of your body. So if you decompose everything down to just the elements, then that's what you're worth. That's what you've got in you. Now those yatsar, sculpted elements, sculpted molecules. Okay, And then asa is to put something together out of something. And this describes the physiology and the biochemistry of the body. The things working together, making them actually function and work. Okay? So if we look at the verse again, if I can get my... All right, so let's look at it with adding the meanings of the words in a, an expanded translation. Everyone that is called by my name, for I created his soul out of nothing, uh, out of nothing for my glory. I have formed his anatomy. Yea, I have made his glands and organs to function in him in the earthly environment. Okay. So there are three verbs in creation. The soul, the body, and the physiology. Right? The form and the and the function. So the soul and the form and the function. God's word is very precise. Much too precise for those cavemen running around making cave drawings. Okay? These people had to be smart to know these kind of things. All right? Had to be smart to know these things thousands of years ago and to be able to understand when God told them what he had done. Okay? All right. Questions. Number one. Question number one. Who's first? In the first... Um, 
Sure, that's fine. Okay. In 2 Peter 3, 5-7, where it says, For this they willingly are ignorant. So who are they in that statement? And why are they willingly? That means that they just don't want to believe, right? Right. So anybody got that in their Bible? The question is, in uh, 2 Peter 3, 5-7, through 7, uh, why does it say, for this they are willingly ignorant? Of that by the word of God, the heavens and earth were old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So, I thought that was an interesting. I'm getting there. I'm getting... Why are they willingly ignorant? In the last day, blatant scoffers will come, being propelled by their own evil urges, and saying, Where is his promised return? For ever since our ancestors died, all things have continued as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately suppress this fact that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by means of water. <laughs> okay, the question was uh, the people in uh, 2 Peter 3 5 through 7. Uh, it says that they are willingly ignorant uh, of these facts. Why, who are they and, uh, and why? Okay. So um, uh, we have to look at the context. And uh, to get the direct context, we have to go back to verse 3. And he says, uh, from the uh, Amplified Version, he says, To begin with, you must know and understand this, that scoffers will come in the last days scoffing uh, who, people who walk after their own fleshly desires. Yes. Yeah. And say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the forefathers fell asleep, all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation. Okay? And that's interesting because uh, evolutionists, part of the theory of evolution is that everything has been the same Ever since, uh, li since the universe began, everything has continued without change. That's, that's, that's part of the theory of evolution for them to come to their conclusions that they come to. Okay. And uh, so it's very interesting that that was specifically mentioned uh, back in uh, Second Peter and uh, uh, as part of evolution today because... Uh, they just have to, they have to assume that, that it just kept on the way, you know, everything is, has been continual. Okay. And then verse 5, For they willfully overlook and forget this fact, that the heavens came into existence long ago by the word of God, and the earth also which was formed out of water and by means of water, through which the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. Notice also the word perished there. Did the earth perish when uh, at uh, Noah's flood? No. 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 The earth did not perish at that time. Okay. So that's another clue as to why that reference isn't to Noah's flood, that it has to be. Could people say, though, it perishes, that the earth perished as they knew it? The question was, could, uh, could people say that it perished because, as they knew it because it wasn't the same after that? Yeah, they could, but, but then you would have to say that life perished, not the earth perished. Uh, that, uh, that, that certain animals, part, some of the animals perished. But when you say the earth perished, that's you know, the whole thing. Yeah. All right, next question. Okay, we're having this question and answer period because somebody had questions. <laughs> Would you like to hand your question up so that I read it? Or this isn't legible. It's not legible? Okay. She's an artist, but she can't write legibly. Oh, okay. 
Anybody else while she's deciphering her own handwriting? Oh, well, I can read it. Oh, you can read it. Okay. Which one I do. Oh, okay. You have more than one? Okay, do them all. What I was talking about is the que a demon possession in the first question. In the first, part. first section. So you talked about how whether demons had a body, didn't have a body, were, were they angels? Oh, they're not demons. You talked about several things in the topic of demons. Right. Okay, the question is uh, demons. Demons are disembodied spirits probably of angels probably of angels who lost their bodies who God took their bodies away from them okay what is demon possession demon possession is that spirit of that angel uh, without a body wanting a body so they are, they will enter into human bodies to uh, to be able to have a body, because they. What's that? Where is the soul of the person that the demon spirit goes into? Where is their soul there? They're they're there. They're there. Does it override their? Uh, it, I mean, because all I know is from what I've seen on television or movies. Movies, or right? Is that then it controls that demon controls that? Although I have read, you know, in scripture where the demoniac, where they act like they're crazy and right. do, you yeah. know, Demon-possessed people, uh, uh, demon-possessed people c can be controlled by demons, okay? Um, how much of so-called demon possession is true demon possession and how much of it is uh, psychotic states uh, is questionable. You know, some of them are psychotic, some of them are truly demon possessed. Um, I guess you would know when you came across them. Right? Or if the demon spoke to you like the demon in the Gadarene demoniac who uh, Jesus, as Jesus approached, said, uh, leave us alone. <laughs> uh, and he said, what is your name? And he said, our, our name is Legion because there are many of us. Okay. And uh, then they said, we pray you, we beg you, do not cast us into Tartarus where the angels who came down and cohabited with the women t before Noah's time, where they're they're kept in chains and darkness. So don't send us there. So Jesus said, "Okay, I'll send you into the pigs." And so then the pigs went crazy when the demons went into the pigs and ran over the cliff and fell in the water, which is a terrible thing for <laughs> demons also. So. <laughs> I would assume so, unless they were uh, swimming pigs. And uh, I know of dancing pigs and flying pigs, but I don't know of any swimming pigs. So, but with the, with the demon possession, it's my understanding that I've been taught that a Christian cannot be possessed. Okay, the question or the statement was, it's my understanding that a demon cannot be uh, demon possessed. Uh, that a... A Christian cannot be demon-possessed. Uh, there is a school of thought that says, no, a Christian cannot be demon-possessed. And there is a school of thought that a Christian can only be demon-possessed by giving permission or by inviting the demon to possess them, that they can do that. Okay. Um, I mean... The subject of demons would probably take us, uh, demon possession would probably take us another six weeks to fully explore, you know, to fully study. Uh, but we know that demons cause physical affliction. 
uh, some of the people that De Jesus healed, he healed by casting out the demons. They had a physical condition that was caused by demons. So we know that they cause that. They cause mental conditions, craziness. Um, Christians being possessed by a demon, my belief is that they cannot because even if the Christian invites them in, the Holy Spirit is still there. And, and the demon cannot, cannot live in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So that's mine. Now one of the things that they have found in uh, alien abduction, which is a form of demon demon uh, activity uh, is that Christians cannot be abducted without giving permission or asking to go. And so that's where that kind of that idea of, of a Christian giving permission or inviting the demon and could be demon possessed. But that's a little different issue of, of being abducted, being taken away uh, on, a, on a ship or something. Uh, as far as we know, that's correct. They are the disembodied fallen angels. They don't have an angel body. And is it, no matter what, is that the case for all of these fallen angels? The ones that we don't know that. We don't know if it's all fallen angels or if it's only certain of the fallen angels, like the ones who who came down and cohabited with the women. Um, there are some people that believe that their spirits are the ones that are, are demons. Um, but there's also, it says in Second Peter, I think, also, that, that they are reserved for judgment in chains in Tartarus. So that would mean that that they couldn't be out roaming around uh, if they're in chains. So, so we do know that they are most likely fallen angels. We don't know if there are any other class of beings that they could be. Are they the spirits of the Nephilim? The, the human angelic hybrid from the cohabitation of angels and women, human women. That's another theory that they that they are the demons. So, but we don't have any direct evidence as to which bodiless spirit is the demon. We just know there are demons. That's all we know for absolute fact. Next question. Um, at what point in time after light and before light would the renovation of the earth by fire be? At what point in time will the renovation of the earth by fire be? Okay. After the millennial reign of Christ, after the thousand year reign of Christ. So you have church age. Church, age, rapture, okay. the tribulation, seven years, okay. second coming, okay. millennium, And at the end of the millennium, then you have fire renovation. And then, you, then we go into eternity future. Okay. Okay. After the church age, rapture, then the tribulation period, then the second coming of Christ, then the millennial uh, age, 1,000 years. That's 1,000 years. And then at the end of that, then uh, the... The earth is renovated by 
the heavens and the earth are renovated by fire, and then, then we go into eternity. New heavens and new earth, right. The new heavens and the new earth. Is the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium? Yes. The uh, millennium uh, can also be called the kingdom age because that's when the kingdom comes. The Lord's Prayer, you know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Okay. That's for the Jews. The kingdom is for the Jews. Uh, that's earthly. Okay. So that's the earthly kingdom. So Christians don't pray for the kingdom to come. No. The Christians pray Maranatha, may the Lord come. Next question. Another one? Or is that it? What? Not at the moment. Okay. All right. Did we get that one? Is that one? You, you understand that one? Um, beats me. I haven't looked it up for a long time. So I'd have to look up uh, firmament in the in the Hebrew. Verdua, yeah. The uh, Amplified Bible translates it expanse. Whether or not that's the the whole uh, Barabrashit of Genesis. Oh, nuts, I dropped it. Well, the only reason I ask this is in the, in the text. It says the firmament is the abode of the sun, moon, and stars, and the galaxies, but it doesn't really say, okay, just take my word for it. That's what it means. I, say what? In the, in the text. In, the text, in, the, in his text, in his yeah. Text. Not the Bible text. Right. right. Yeah, he does. Uh, okay. He says, uh, in the Jewish translation, it says, God made the dome and divided the water under the dome from the water above the dome. <laughs> well, that cleared that up. Uh-huh. <laughs> No, it's the uh, it's the Houston Astrodome. Uh, let's see here. These are all Greek dictionaries and Greek gr Old Testament word studies. There we go. You can tell I spend uh, have twenty books on Greek and one on Hebrew. So guess how much Hebrew I know. All right. Look, I opened it up to the F's. And while you're looking that up, does the, maybe you just didn't get far enough in the teaching, but does a guy give a theory or as to what happened to all the water if the entire universe was filled with water? What happened to all of it? What happened to all of the water? Yeah. Uh, I don't. 
Well, he said that he would get into that later, didn't he? So I haven't even read all of his stuff. It's a lot of pages. Firmament, masculine, uh, the expanse spread out over the earth in which the stars appear as if they were fixed, the arch or vault of heaven. Um, firmamentum, or according to our present knowledge of the heavens, that extensive circumambient fluid, the atmosphere. Right. So we have two. <laughs> in, the same, uh, in the same definition, we have firmament, the atmosphere, and firmament, uh, the uh, outer space where the stars appear. So it would take a much uh, more uh, detailed word study than Wilson's. Uh, Hebrew. Yeah, to, and to interpret to make his to make his argument he is right, and he does that because it says that the earth was in the water. Okay. Well, anytime you hear water it, during this time, you're thinking ice, okay? Because it was frozen. It was, it was frozen. So if it's all frozen, how are there different sections? Because isn't a frozen body of water a frozen body of water? How would you have the two sections? Well, if, the well uh, what, who said there's two sections? No, because he said he divided the top. top he divided them, right. Right. So what if you have two heavens that are frozen, the atmosphere heaven is frozen and the outer space is frozen, you you have two two different places that are frozen. You have the earth that's frozen in the solar system that's frozen. That's why he's saying that the earth is in the water as well as being covered by water. Okay. Uh huh. And then you put an ice cube and a little thing of water, and you froze that. You would then have one ice cube, wouldn't you? Hmm, you'd have an ice cube in an ice cube. Okay, that's a good description. Or if you put a pea, like a ball if you a put a, what if you put a pea in a in an ice cube tray, and you froze the pea in the ice cube, and then you took that ice cube out and you put it in a bowl of water, and with part it. of it over top of the water, and then you froze it, then you would have the earth. Covered, by, covered water. by water and in the water. In the water. Right. Is that? Yep. Okay. Yeah. See, my little pea brain, we have to use peas. Peas are making, hey, okay, so that was a good analogy. If you took a pea to represent the earth and put it in, and froze it in, a, in a, 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 an ice cube tray and then took that ice cube out and put it in another bigger container and froze that, then you would have the earth, the pea, covered with water but yet in the water as well. In the ice as well. If it's covered with water and we're doing like the bobber type thing and it's also in the water while also being covered, if you, if this is the water and our little pea ice cube is sitting in there, what is all this area? Well, in, in that was his poor analogy, but it, it's water. It's ice also. It's, so it's, it's ice. Within water and then it would be a bobber under the water rather than floating on the water. Yeah, it looked like it was sticking out of the water, so there wouldn't have been anything above it. Right. Yeah. All interesting stuff, but I guess we'll find out for sure. Yeah, we'll know the full answer. So our conclusion would be the reason why we would want to study this first and then know these things would be so that if you were having an evolution conversation or for anybody to be saying, well, anything about God, 
more equipped and you have the scripture to say this mm-hmm. is what we know about earth right. and God and, and creation. And right. Yeah, the whole purpose of the study of non-essential doctrine, which is any doctrine other than how to live the Christian life, is to be able to answer because the Bible says be ready to answer. Right? And so uh, if you have to be able to answer people like college professors who try to browbeat you or even high school teachers. who so There was a case just not too long ago of, a, of a, an English class professor who was talking about Uh, in his class, if you are a Republican, you are a racist. If you are a Tea Partier, you're a racist. If you are anything other than a liberal, you're a racist. Um, Because your whole life is consumed with hatred for black people. Well, uh, first of all, what place does that have in an English writing class, creative writing class? That's politics. That's you know. That's not. That's not a writing class. So, but that's uh, and and he says, uh, if you are a Republican, then you need to get out of my class because you don't belong. Huh? He was a white professor. But see, that's a bias. A bias that if you are against anything that the president says, it's because you're a racist. If you want voter ID so that there is no voting voting fraud, you're a racist. You're trying to keep black people from voting even though the statistics show that the states where they have voter ID, the percentage of black voters goes up and the percentage of Hispanic voters goes up, not down. So their argument is false, but that doesn't matter because their bias is you have to be a racist. The point is that we need to be ready to to answer any question. How do we get off on, on that? Well, because there are, you're going to get questions, you're going to get people who say, well, you are a racist, for example, or that the Bible is not true, or this is stupid to think that God created the earth 6,000 years ago. Okay? Yeah. That's ridiculous. So then when you know this stuff, you can say, well... So your point was just that she may even encounter adults in a learning situation that will challenge her beliefs. Fellow students. Yeah, fellow students. Anybody. Fellow students, you can, you know, young people have lots of questions till they, you right. know, I understand young people, you know, as they're discussing things among themselves. For a teacher in a classroom to stand up and say that, which I know they do, um, to me, that's so wrong. It's, it's just wrong. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've brought it out of you. You're going to ask. Uh, this is still more on the earth question. Right. Like, the earth, doesn't it support, like, the earth, does it have iron and whatnot? Like, support it? Yeah. Does that also be frozen as well? No, it's a covering of the earth, or over the earth. So the mole people that live inside the inner earth, they were okay. <laughs> Are we still broadcasting? Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. 